Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the episode five of our se second season of the Future Sport webinar. Today's topic, as you can see from the screen, is the future of education, which is something that's really dearly close to our heart here, you know, from all of us here at the Likwani School of Public Policy. As an education institution, you know, we get to talk a lot about education on a daily basis, just because, you know, there's our bread and butter, right? And Today we have uh, we are joined by you know a stellar panelist uh, and a wonderful moderator, one of my friend and colleague. But before we do so, I would like to say hello to all participants who have joined us, and if you could share with us where you know you're dialing from, and you know just to get a sense of you know where you are uh, at. Oh, we have Marco from Hong Kong. Hello, Marco. Hope you're keeping well. We have somebody from Dubai. Damon is dialing from China. Hello. Oh, wow. We have a participants dialing in from South Africa. Hi, Leticia. Hi, Marjorie from the Philippines. It's so wonderful to see, you know, all the international participants and also friends and colleagues from Singapore are logging into this webinar. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce our wonderful um, moderator, friends and colleagues, Eddie Chu, who is from the research uh, who is from the Institute of Policy Studies. And um, Eddie will, you know, be facilitating the, uh, the great conversation on the topic of future certification today. Um, Eddie, uh, take it away from here. Thank you, Ani. I'm so delighted to be here. So thank you again to Executive Education at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I'm so delighted to have with us here uh, a stellar panel, as uh, Ani has mentioned. So I'm just going to do a very short round of introduction, and then uh, the speakers will give their opening statements, and uh, we'll we'll take it from there. So let me just start off. Uh, we're going to have Michael Clement. Michael Clem Michael Clement has been uh, he's an education professional. He has extensive experience in international education, in employability, education technology, and entrepreneurship. Uh, we have also with us uh, Yvonne Kong Ho. Yvonne is deeply passionate about career resilience and career longevity. She has spent close to 17 years of experiences in education, people, and career development. So she really wants to see people working towards building and strengthening their career capital at every stage of their lives. And we have Dr. Peter Bishop, or as he likes to go uh, by Peter. So Peter has been uh, the founder and executive director of Teach the Future, uh, which is an organization meant to encourage and support educators who want to include futures thinking in their classes and schools at all levels. He retired as Professor Emeritus of Strategic Foresight and Director of the Pro Graduate Program in Foresight at the University, uh, at the University of Houston. So we, we have with us here a stellar panel, pa uh, stellar panel here, and we're going to look into education, the future of education. So education, we all know, uh, as Anya's mentioned, is critically important in the transformation of human societies. It has allowed us to connect with each other. But as with all the trends that we've all been experiencing, there are some very important questions. With the advent of new technology and innovation, how will education look like in the future? How can we work in our respective capacities to make education more equitable? How can education in the future support individuals, communi communities, and societies for meaningful work, sustainable development, as well as personal well-being? So these are all important questions, and uh, I'm just so delighted to have this panel here. They come from very diverse areas and very diverse interests. Uh, so uh, 
So without any further ado, uh, Michael, would you like to help us kick things off? Yes, my, my pleasure. Thanks, Eddie, for the introduction, and thanks, Agavai School of Public Policy, uh, for inviting me here and, and sharing my, insight, my insights. And I'm great to see so many uh, other um, established uh, educators here. Uh, very briefly um, about myself, and then I, I'm, I, I love to share my, my intake for um, for future of education. So, originally from Germany, but I spent 20 years in Asia, last 20 years, 15 years in education. I was lucky, I would say lucky, to have spent time in different segments of education. And when we talk about future of education, it's not only about higher education, right? So, I spent five years in a training institute. Um, where I set up a training institute in, in, in India as, as well as in Singapore. And then I was eight years with higher education of NUS, uh, employability, career services, as well as uh, in the international office. And then um, I spent two years with Minerva University as an American liberal arts college as their Asia representative. But um, the last two years, I, um, I spent my time building up an organization, which you can see on the screen, the Singapore Education Network, which is a kind of a funnel, it's a kind of a platform for education professionals in Singapore and the region, uh, dealing with various, various things, and not focusing on one, one segment. But what, what combines everyone, including the, the members of my network and my alliance is we care about education. Uh, um, and um, I care about education for many years, and I care because I also worried that in many ways education has gone in, in different, sometimes I would say wrong direction, and COVID, and I think we can't run away from touching on COVID as well, put things in different perspectives, uh, has showed shortcomings, but has also showed promise, because I think when it comes to uh, more of a use of, of digital remote learning, which I believe should play a large role in the future, then COVID or the pandemic and the restrictions, what came of it uh, uh, helped. But um, <clears throat> future of education, and, and there are so many different aspects I could touch upon, but I, I choose to very briefly just mention five different areas, which I think are key pillars. I don't think these are... <coughs> is an exhaustive list and I'm happy to hear my fellow panelists to add on or criticize or take it off. But I want to mention five different pillars which I think will be critical to um, continue progress of education. Number one, and I think that's not a surprise, it's been going for a while, but it will continue going is the area of lifelong learning. Um, that, uh, as we all know, because of um, the shrinking young population literally globally and uh, large economies, developed economies, they're, the younger working population um, gets smaller and smaller, the young population in general. So with the time people work uh, or the, um, the time people um, spend while uh, contributing to the economy and at the same time, their skill level changing, their skill level uh, required on work, in the workforce or in the workplace changes so drastically fast that lifelong learning be, remains and becomes even more critical and that will have a huge impact on, on education and particularly who is the education provider, who provides that skill. So lifelong learning, universities will play a good an important part of it, but um, their education system as such needs to be needs to evolve and the government uh, will play or needs to play um, a big role in it as, as well. Um, another area <coughs> which, which I believe has started but it's still very much in the beginning is I, I would call it the decentralization of uh, of, of um, education for many decades or centuries education has been I, I would say monopolized to some degree or centralized through governments and then through institutions often public but um, the free emergence of more skills based education of corporates diving deep into education, offering a lot of educational courses, skills-based courses, and establishing themselves as an education brand. I mean, I could mention the, <coughs> the Googles or Microsofts, particularly in the, in the, in the IT space, there are many others. They, they, they are becoming a comp competition to, to establish institutions. Of course, there are partnerships possible, but um, at the same time, corporates always move much faster. So, uh, and under the topic of decentralization of education, I think that's for me, it's, it's one of the um, developments which will, which will continue in the future. Uh, another um, area which very much has <coughs> come up through pandemic is the emergence of hybrid learning. 
I don't think we go full-time online. In fact, many are, are happy to be back in the classroom. So I think hybrid is a feature. Is it going to be 80, 20, 20, 80 or something in between? That's, that's a big question. But um, the model has been adopted by many, sometimes for cost reasons, sometimes for equity or accessibility reasons. And I think um, it's, it's important that this will continue to be um, explored, implemented, um, still um, considering that quality and impact of education cannot be undermined. In fact, it should be improved, right? So hybrid, hybrid learning. Um, then another topic, and this is a, is a complex topic actually, is personalized learning or personalized education. Uh, what does it mean? Um, um, in the past, many education products, it's a one size fits all, one major, four years, three years, or one, I want to learn data analytics, it's six months, but we all know there is, people learn sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Some have prior skills, prior um, learning, which in most, most cases is not recognized by current institutions, or it's difficult to measure. So I think personalized learning, also mixing and matching skills-based, academic, more applied, non-applied, these uh, uh, personalized learning and then a lot of uh, data analytics come into the picture or also different types of assessment. It's a, it's, it's a difficult, complicated area, but I will, I'm quite certain in the future it will play um, an important role, not everywhere, but um, to make also, again, learning potentially cheaper, faster, but uh, then probably also fairer at times. Um, the last area which I, I believe is important and I quickly mentioned it before, is more skills-based learning. Um, topic is here micro-credentials, breaking down large certifications or large degrees into smaller pieces, which again can be taken at different institutions, should be um, uh, widely, <coughs> uh, widely recognized. So when we kind of about digital certification or skills wallets, sometimes blockchain-based, so um, these micro-credentials, again, corporates also come into the picture. Micro-credentialing has already started a few years ago, but I, I believe it will continue to grow and governments is important to bring credibility to the system. Uh, but I see a lot of good and important initiatives um, in Asia, but also worldwide. Thank you. All right. Uh, oh, wait, I have wait, yeah. I have the questions. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot my <laughs> questions, right? Okay. Um, I have one of one, my favorite question. I have two questions which I like to ask our panelists or also the audience. Number one, um, particularly when you're a little older, um, then it becomes more interesting for me the answer. If you would study today, knowing what you know, what would you study? Would you study at all? Would you study at a different university? What major? Maybe no major, just certificates. Um, so that would be interesting to know. Um, and um, uh, the second part is, do you think that um, uh, education is too expensive? Uh, and again, some, some countries are super cheap. I mean, I'm from Germany, it's essentially free. And then you have other countries, it's very expensive. So there's a huge difference. Uh, but um, is there a way to make education more affordable? Let's not talk, let's not talk cheap but more affordable. I mean, Singapore is an interesting city with all kinds of different subsidies, et cetera. Uh, but generally speaking, is, is, are there ways to make it more affordable? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So five pillars of education. So we have lifelong education, decentralization, question of hybrid learning, what's the mix between online and offline, personalized learning, what does that mean? And uh, I, you said micro-credentials, so I take it as desegregation and standardization of learning. So five pillars and his two questions to the other panelists and to the audience. If you could study again today, what would it be? And uh, how can we make education more affordable? So these are questions for the other panelists and for the audience. Uh, feel free to chime in in the chat or in Q&A. Sorry, in the Q&A mostly, please. And yeah, so thanks, Michael. And uh, up next is Yvonne, who will take us through uh, her opening statement and her questions. So Yvonne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you, Michael. I took a lot of notes. A very good evening to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for spending the evening with us. Thank you, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for inviting me as well. 
and I'm Yvonne. I work for Singapore Management University. I work for this division called SMUX, and X stands for experiential learning, because I believe very much in the power of problem-based experiential learning, where my students can, together with faculty members and industry partners, come together to solve real-world problems. So, you know, if you have read my history and my background, I spent many years in career development, <clears throat> pardon me, where I was working with students, with industry partners, preparing students to be ready for the workforce. And while really coaching them for many, many years, while speaking to industry partners for many, many years, I realized that at the end of the day, it's not just career development we have to look at. We have to look at workforce development. We have to look at how do we enhance the betterment of the workforce. So that was why I did a jump from career development into experiential learning, where I see it as a very good tool to really build up our workforce. You know, I was just thinking when I was given the topic of the edu education of the future, I was just thinking out loud. And I, I asked my children, so I'm a mom of two children, they are 13 and they are 11. I was asking them, what do you think is the education of the future? And then my daughter, the 11 year old who behaves like she's 21, she asked me, what is the purpose of education? And I'm like, whoa, okay, <clears throat> wrong question at the dining table, you know, and I'm like, how am I going to answer you? But she really made me sit down to think, what is the purpose of education? Because if we cannot answer that question, then we can't really look at the, the future of education. I was just thinking, so I was looking at her and it brought me to a time, allow me to share this very short story, just before the COVID pandemic hit. I brought the whole family in November 2019 to do, a, to do this volunteering trip in Phnom Penh. So I brought this group of, um, I, I, I would say there's about 20 of us, there are about 10, cho 10 children in that trip. So we went to this orphanage, we brought our clothes over to donate to the orphanage, we brought this biscuits, you know, it's a bit like those tea biscuits that you eat together with tea or coffee, it's crumbly, and we gave out those biscuits at the orphanage. And of course, you know, crumbs just dropped. And usually in Singapore, when crumbs drop, our children will just sweep it aside and then continue eating whatever is left. But this group of orphans at the orphanage, when I observed them and when I looked at how they ate the biscuits, they knew exactly where the crumbs dropped. They pick up those crumbs and they put it back into their mouths. So when I, when I went back to the bus, I looked at all the 10 children who were in the trip and looked at their, their parents or the adults. I just sit and I told them, you know, my dear children, all 10 of you, the fact that you're born in Singapore, you have won the lottery of life. You did not choose to be born in Singapore, but the fact that you are, you have won the lottery of life. And that means you can do more for people. It brought me to the point of, I was just thinking, what is really the purpose of education? Because I'm, I work in a university, because I've worked in three universities, because I'm a mother, I believe with all of my heart that education is not just about knowledge acquisition. It's not even just about passing exams or getting degrees. To be very, very honest, you know, the World Wide Web has made it so easy. And of course, proven by the pandemic, it's really not difficult to gain knowledge. You can gain content, but what do you make out of it? So I believe with all of my heart that education is there because through education, we can elevate poverty. Through education, we can break the poverty cycle. Through education, we can make people's lives better. So that's to me, the education, you know, the future of education because with education, it's a tool that we can use to really make people's lives better, to make the world better, to really achieve the sustainable development goals that we all have, that we all know of. But how can that be done? So with my 11-year-old, we were talking about like, you know, what do you want to see in, in the future of education? So of course, she came up with very interesting ideas. Some are very aligned with what Michael mentioned, actually. Like, oh, I don't need to go to one university. I can go to a few universities to get my degree, right, mommy? And I'm like, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I don't have to go to school, right? Can I start tomorrow? I say, no, you have to go to school tomorrow. But she began to give me a lot of very interesting ideas because she's out of the system in some sense. So as a student, she's looking into it. And that I would say it's what education can be. But I was just thinking, if education is going to elevate people's poverty, it's going to elevate a lot of issues, mitigate challenges in the world, I think we need to focus on two things. We need to focus on skills. 
And I was just, you know, looking at all the research reports by World Economic Forum, OECD, you know, how can we make it very simple? So I came up with an acronym. Actually, the purpose was to teach my children, you know, about the skills that I hope for them to have when they grow up. And this acronym is ACRE, because I hope that with what they gain, they can actually cover acres of people. They can influence acres of people, ACRE. So the skills that I hope for them to have in a nutshell, ACRE, adaptability, creative problem solving, critical thinking skills, resilience, and empathy. Many a time, you know, because of the pandemic, I've been able to do a lot of pro bono career coaching over, the, over Zoom. So I speak to people, and that's actually one of my interests as well. I work with a lot of older workers. I help to bring them back into the workforce, especially when they are displaced out of it for various reasons. And a lot of them, I realize that adaptability is an issue for various reasons. Some of them, you know, because they have been in a career for many, many, many years, it's very hard for them to reinvent themselves. And even with the younger ones, when I speak with them sometimes through career coaching, they will tell me that that was not what I was taught in school. Why is it that my boss wants me to do this now? Like, you know, it's not covered in the job description, right, Yvonne? Why am I expected to do this? But the, the fact remains, and you and I know, when there is no adaptability, it's very hard to reinvent. When the situation calls for it, when the task calls for it, we have to somehow learn it through, through YouTube, through Udemy, through TED Talks. I, you know, there's so many ways to learn, but you have to be adaptable. You have to critically think. You have to be very creative. All this will help you to solve the problems of the future. And of course, it's something, this is something that I really hope. And I believe if you were to be in the situations that a lot of my my mature workers have been in, you will know what I mean. Resilience is really about when you fall, you come back again. When you fall, you come back again. You bounce back. You try again and again. It's something that our young people must have. Our every single worker in the workforce must have. And of course, last but not least, it's empathy. We can say all that we want for, you know, the workforce of the future, the educational you know, I'm sorry, <clears throat> the education or the, the future education, pardon me. But if there is no empathy, if we are unable to see things and empathize with people from their perspectives, I think we will probably have failed everything that we've been given because we will not be able to understand their pains in the realm of their reality. But what are really the skills for? I would say there's one framework that I would like to share. It comes from the latest career development literature. In the past, we were taught to be T-shaped professionals, we need to have breadth of knowledge, but we also need to have some depth. But we also know that technology has been, has been displacing that area of depth. So the new framework, the second, you know, newest framework is we need to be a pie-shaped professional, have some breadth, but also have two areas of depth. But the latest, latest, latest career development literature says that we need to be a comb-shaped professional. When you hold a comb and you comb your hair, it's not just one pillar is not just two pillars, it's multiple pillars, multiple areas of depth. I'll give you an example. So let's say, just an example, I'm a HR professional. I know HR. I, I know how to recruit. I know how to, you know, like retain talents. I know how to do compensation and benefits. I know a bit of everything. But my one area of depth is recruitment. And I've been doing it for 30 years. But what in one day, technology replaces recruitment. Technology can replace people now. Oh, no worries. I'm going to build another area of depth. Other than recruitment, mm, I'm also quite good at retaining talents. But what if technology or someone else can replace that, can displace you and what you do? As we are speaking, a lot of people that I know of, especially the younger ones, they are very into side hustles. So instead of one, two areas of depth, they have become certified baristas. They can make coffee. They have become home bakers with certificates. They have gone to Le Cordon Bleu. They've gotten certificates. They've learned to bake all kinds of things. They are building multiple areas of depth. And I believe that will be the future of education where we have those skills, the ACRE, and we continue to build our multiple areas of depth so that regardless of what's going to happen in the future, the people continue to reinvent themselves again and again. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I think about the future of education. I would say one question I have for my fellow panelists, as well as 
the attendees here. I know it's a bit of a long question. Allow me to summarize a little. So like what I mentioned earlier, as a mom and as an educator, I always want to see the people that I work with, the people that I mentor, and my own children to have that spirit of excellence, to do their best in all that they do. But I also wonder, how can we build within them the, the ability to differentiate the spirit of excellence and perfectionism? Because if they pursue the spirit of excellence, I think that is good. But if they pursue perfectionism, I think that might be a, a little dangerous. And even I would say, I mean, it's not sustainable, right? So how can we then help people to differentiate, being the best that it can be without being a perfectionist? Yeah, that's my question. Thank wow. you, Eddie. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Yvonne. So Yvonne has also put a lot of things uh, up for discussion. Uh, ACRE, that's a tremendous, uh, that's an excellent uh, acronym for Thank you. Uh, adaptability, creativity, resilience, empathy, and uh, also your challenge uh, yeah, and your advice uh, as a coach to, <laughs> to all of us uh, to try to be comb-shaped professionals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, your question for us is how do we maintain a spirit of excellence while avoiding, uh, if I may paraphrase, yeah. while avoiding toxic perfectionism, right? So uh, this is a question for the panelists and for the audience. If you, for the audience, if you want to, uh, if you want to participate, feel free to do so in the chat. If you have more questions, please put it in the Q&A. And now, uh, after hearing the first two panelists, uh, Peter, uh, what are, are your thoughts about the future of education and if you have any reflection on what uh, the two panelists have said. So Peter, over to you. Well, Eddie, I really want to thank uh, you as Michael and, and Yvonne have done, uh, including us in this outstanding discussion. I wish we could go on all day. It would be, uh, there, you've opened up so many topics. I do have to complain a little bit though, Eddie, and with Annie, you've given me the toughest job. These two <laughs> stirring presentations, Michael has mined the, uh, the weak signals of education and looked at all kinds of different ones and Yvonne's passionate uh, statement about how education should be. Uh, I, in one way, I have a very easy job just to say, amen, yes, wonderful. But I also have a harder job in trying to give something that is unique and different uh, to this panel. So let me try and do the latter. I do say the amen. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, let me give you a little insight into how I, as a futurist, I'm not afraid to call myself that, 40 years, 45 years of teaching and and trying to create the future in, in, in our organization called Teach the Future. Uh, we, when we begin teaching about futures, we talk about multiple futures, of course, not single futures. We don't do predictions, as you know. We do alternative scenarios. And there's actually three kinds of futures that we work on. The first of those comes from traditional forecasting, and we call it the expected future. Uh, it's where we're headed. It's, if, if nothing surprising occurs, then uh, definitely this is where we will probably end up. Uh, it's what predictors will do. It's what consultants will do. They'll give you the expected future. Thank you very much. Give me my money. Uh, good luck to you in the future and being there. Of course, the, the, the unique aspect of foresight is that we don't stop there. We say yes, but, and the yes, but is what if, what might happen instead? And those are the alternative futures of which there are myriad. But nevertheless, we think about the alternatives, uh, and I want to go, go into that as well. And the final is then, what do we want to see happen? What, what's our preferred future? And I like to keep those things separate rather than conflating them. So let me start with the expected future. And uh, I'm, uh, as, I, as, as you mentioned, was teaching uh, foresight for many, many years, decades at the University of Houston preparing professional futurists for the marketplace, many of whom went on to careers in that. I'm delighted to, uh, to, be, to have been part of, privileged really to be part of that. Um, and, uh, and now I'm a, I guess you might call a social entrepreneur, an attempt to create change rather than describe change. Okay, in, into the pool. I have to tell you that nothing that I learned as a professor over 30 or 40 years taught me how to do this. <laughs> I'm completely unprepared for this. And yet, nevertheless, I think someone needs to do it to bring futures thinking into, uh, into education. So uh, unfortunately, my experience in education is not quite so optimistic as perhaps Michael and Yvonne have pointed out. Uh, the expected future 
I make a distinction. I learned a distinction from a professor of history of science a long time ago. He made a very simple distinction between two types of institutions in society, what he called innovative institutions and conserving institutions. And innovative institutions are those who uh, absolutely have to innovate to stay alive. We can think of business clearly in the commercial sector, uh, sports, um, innovations, lots of innovation, and uh, entertainment, for instance. Very, all very competitive fields where competition is on the doorstep. You have to continually be innovating and changing in order simply to survive. You don't survive. Conserving institutions also play a role in society. They are conserving traditions, knowledge, uh, culture, socialization of students and young people into the culture. And that's an important function. And of course, those are uh, religion, uh, government in general, and of course, education. Uh, the problem with being a conserving institution is that innovation comes very, very, in a very difficult way. Education is fundamentally based on the past. The knowledge that we have, the traditions that we share, most people think that the role of the educator is to transmit knowledge from the past uh, generations and traditions to the future generations. That's part of it. Uh, but as we have realized, the, 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 the state of knowledge has changed in our world. I mean, the big bang, of course, is the internet. I'm not giving anybody anything they didn't already know, but I claim we haven't really digested that, particularly in terms of education. We are pushing, and, and Michael and, and Yvonne have already talked about it, we're pushing content still, we're reading textbooks, we're testing knowledge rather than skills. I had a conversation with a history faculty and I say, okay, you're teaching all of these facts about history, which I guess some, some people might want to know or need to know. But what are you teaching students to do with those facts? What is, what's the value of historical thinking? And therefore, going back to Michael's point, shifting from a content-based uh, education where 80% of what students are doing in class is learning knowledge, knowledge that they could get literally in the palm of their hand <laughs> when they go look things up. I don't know if you, if you have millennials in your family, but they know exactly where all that stuff is. And, 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 and Yvonne's uh, daughter's question, mom, why am I learning all this stuff? I agree with her. That's a really good question. And a lot of it is a waste of time. So one of the futures is that somehow there will be a shift away from the studying of knowledge and the passing on the transmission of knowledge to the acquisition of skills. And there, is, there are skills in education, except that they're generally in the periphery. In K-12 education, they're on the sports field, they're in the theater, they're in the music and art departments. Those are all skill-based, but they're all peripheral and a lot of times they don't get the emphasis that STEM and science and professional education get. I know a lot of business professors, if there are any business professors out here, apologize for ahead of time by saying they're based upon the knowledge of the field, but not so much the practice of the field. Business people come out of school with an MBA or whatever, and public administration, I think the same way. They know a ton of stuff, but the people who hire them say, yeah, they know a lot, but they don't know how to do a lot. <laughs> and we got to teach them what to do with all their, uh, their knowledge and how they do. So could there be a future of education out there, which is changing? The expected future, unfortunately, is my expected future is no. Education has a lot of inertia. It is built into our culture. It is built into the passing on of traditions, not the innovation uh, of, of, of going forward. So how does the alternative future occur? Well, I, I tend to be, uh, I tend to believe that big changes follow big disruptions. The big change that Michael referred to is now hybrid education, forced upon us by the pandemic, a huge disruption, forced education. Let me, add, let me add another word to this conversation, a big word, which is called disintermediation. It is taking the middleman, the middle woman, the middle person, the middle institution out of a process and putting people in touch with the actual uh, producer. Uh, the internet financial services have disintermediated PayPal and, and all the credit card companies and all that have disintermediated the banks. And that started in the 1980s, a long time ago. 
what is the disintermediation possibilities of education? I don't think it's about learning. Education does not, and disintermediation usually blows up a, a monopoly. The monopoly that education has is not learning. All the things we've talked about, MOOCs and you know, YouTube and all of those uh, alternative forms of learning are, are, are big. The problem they don't have is credentials. Well, I think uh, Peter, you froze there for a moment. Uh, let's wait a bit for him to come back on. In the meantime, uh, do look at the chat and see uh, the discussion that we're having there. Uh, I've also had, tried to summarize some of the points that uh, two other speakers have mentioned. So yeah, meanwhile, just uh, take a look at all the discussion that we've been having. Uh, and thank you for your questions. So do keep them coming. We already have a few. We will be addressing them. Uh, but once we get Peter back online. Oh, uh, unfortunately, it looks like Peter has uh, dropped out of the call for now. Uh, I'm sure we'll be trying to have him back online as fast as soon as you can. In the meantime, we already have a few questions. Uh, let me just uh, put down there. So we have one for Inktat. Uh, Inktat's question was, do you think that AI will be featured much in the future of education? So that's one on AI. We have a separate question on the shift away from learning to, uh, from, from knowledge acquisition to skills-based learning. So a question is on the tension between uh, what should be the primary focus of educators? Uh, what is, uh, how, how can we continue to focus on knowledge transmission while still engaging students who are less uh, motivated? So uh, yeah, so I, let me just give the panelists uh, some time to think about that. Uh, yeah, and uh, whoever wants to go next can do so. I, I can jump in. <clears throat> just yeah, a second question. Yep. Um, in terms of uh, should uh, knowledge trans transmission still be primary focus, I would say no. Uh, it's never a black and white answer, never a black and white picture. It's never only skills, so only knowledge. So the, the question is, what is, is, is the ratio, right? Is it a 50 50, 80 20, et cetera? I definitely think skills should be more taught. The biggest bottleneck I see is mon monopoly of universities. <laughs> because um, conceptually speaking, they don't particularly, and I'm, I'm being purposely a bit controversial here, they don't, they don't particularly see the need to do it because they sit comfortably. Uh, because usually issuing degrees requires the government um, permission and the government is also not interested in essentially um, rocking a boat too much because rocking a boat of education in general has a lot of ripple effects, right? Let's talk about parents, et cetera, and, and school system, et cetera. So it's, it's difficult to implement because there's a lot of um, downstream um, implications. Um, and, and that's why I think corporates or the employment market need to push harder that um, more skills based education is introduced, uh, but that has the consequence you need probably different lecturers or professors. It's a different type of pedagogy. It's also probably a lot more out of classroom learning, but again, requires a completely different mindset that university is not a mini city, that you have everything from a supermarket to a sports ground to a swimming pool to a classroom. So, Use the, use the city as your playground or a city or, or, or the countryside, right? And, and secondly, and that comes back to the monopoly. <clears throat> and I asked a question recently as a, at, at a, an SMU conference uh, where we had the OECD um, director as well as uh, our minister of, of education here in Singapore. Are universities willing to accept skills-based certification who are issued by somebody else as part of a degree? So if you want to study um, business analytics, data analytics, something computer related, and somebody comes, okay, you know, I got an Amazon certificate, I have data, data analytics from Google and Microsoft, et cetera. Do you allow me to skip certain modules, right? And then each doesn't matter. 
Are you 18, 20, 25? Who cares? Skills is skills, right? So are universities willing to do that? And that is really a very important big question. And, and I, I really wonder if universities will make that um, leap of faith or let go a bit of a monopoly. I think it would be very good, but okay, again, it has uh, subsidies involved from Ministry of Education and uh, probably less income from universities, but you open the doors to a wider audience. I think it would be good. All right. So the way you addressed it is, uh, are universities willing to let go of their kind of gatekeeper status or skills? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yvonne, do you have any perspective on that? Mm, I would like to thank Nicholas for the question. It's a very good question. I would say, what is the outcome you would like to have for engaging students who are less intrinsically motivated or academically able? If your outcome is to prepare them eventually for the workforce, I think maybe knowledge transmission may not be what we're looking at as the focus. It can be a part of it. If I were to draw a Venn diagram, if we want to prepare them for the workforce to make them, you know, people who really can contribute to the workforce in their own unique ways, then we have to draw. We have to draw a Venn diagram. Knowledge transmission may be a part of it, but knowledge or rather I would say the acquisition of skills, the acquisition of workplace employability skills will be probably another part. And then the intersection of that Venn diagram will be what we are looking at. It's really their unique contribution to the world. So, you know, in career development, when we look at, let's say, you know, if we were to pull out a student who is um, not extremely engaged, not very academically able, maybe because the person has not found the niche yet, usually when we look at a person like this, I would try to re-engineer it by asking the student using this framework, VIPS, if we can help, if we can help the student to see what are the student's values, interests, personality, and skills, the intersection of these four circles would be the person's unique contribution to the world. So let's say a student, you know, 15-year-old, not extremely keen to study, but the value is like, oh, I, I really want stability. You know, I, I value family time because, you know, I come from a family where I don't see my parents much. They're always busy. They're always working on the weekends. So I value stability and I want to see my family more. The interest of the student could be that, you know, there is a tool that we use, the RISAC tool. So the RISAC tool allows us to see whether the student is very interested in, for example, you know, like um, if the student is very entrepreneurial, if the student is very for example, mechanical, the student likes to work on things or to speak to people, to sell things to people. So we find out about the interest and we find out about the personality. There are a lot of very good tools in the market. And last but not least, the skills of the student. When it comes to a younger person like a student, I try not to sometimes find out too much about the skills because I find that for our young ones today, the learning agility is so strong that when I for example, were to assess them at 15 years old based on the skills that they have, they tend to pigeonhole themselves and say, you see, you see, this is only what I have. So I tend to help them to look at the values, the interests, the personality, and the skills. I tend to put it aside first and say that you find out your values, your interests, your personality first. The skills can always be taken up. You can learn from YouTube, you can learn from someone, you can sit down with a teacher, you can buy a book to learn, you can take on the diploma or eventually, you know, a certificate from somewhere to learn. But if we can find out the person's values, interests, personality, hopefully that can increase the engagement of the student and the student can see a goal and to hopefully put the student back into the, I would say, into the system to gain and gather the knowledge and the skills that the student has and the student wants to amass so that the student can be prepared for the workforce. I'm not sure that will answer your question, Nicholas. Please feel free to ask more if we, you would like more details. Yeah. Yeah, from, from Yvonne, I get the point on how uh, we should really try to personalize the learning as much as possible and try to uh, get people to understand where the students are coming from and uh, especially their values and see how we can provide the platform for skills training from there. So you're, you're just going upstream, if I, if I were to paraphrase. Yeah, so um, we also had an earlier question on AI, and that was uh, how much do both of you think that AI is becoming a part of uh, education? So maybe, Michael, you want to go first again? It's, it's, it's a difficult question because AI is such a big topic and AI is often actually hidden 
within other technologies or products, right? Even though the, the, the technology AI um, is already is, is ready, but it needs to be adopted, right? Is is like if even if AI is fuel, but you need an engine, right? So you need a product, even if you have fuel, but you don't have an engine to drive, for example. So um, AI, uh, I see AI. Um, um, utilization not in in a dramatic way anytime soon. I think education, generally speaking, as an as a as an as an industry, is quite slow because it's largely publicly driven, uh, often public uh, money involved, and um, it's as as an industry is quite conservative. But AI, I can see AI being used number one for adaptive learning, so essentially technologies <laughs> which uh, again, caters to the different skill level um, of a learner, and that can change during a course, during the course of a certain certificate of a program, etc. And again, that that will that will help. But you need for um, you need for technology to use AI to really to and um, assessment, for example, that's definitely one one area. But also pre course assessment, and then adaptive learning during the course of learning that AI can help study and measure the pace and impact of learning. And I think that uh, I would say that would be critical that if you do a course for one year, some people may not, or some learner may not have achieved what's, what's needed um, after one year, but you only know that after one year, when you do an end, end of a course assessment, right? And But you should have interfered you should have taken a different track. You should have um, maybe learned in a different way much earlier. So it's kind of continuous assessment from where I see AI could be a very useful way um, to, to track learning impact. That sounds a bit theoretical, but I think it's a, it's a very important part which could be applied, particularly in academic, I think it's probably more in the academic environment uh, for institutions, et cetera. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Yvonne, do you want to give it a go? I would say AI will be featured, I would say, rather largely in the future education. I'm looking at the Bloom's taxonomy, which I think a lot of us are very familiar with. And as much as I really love and respect the high-tech, high-touch style of education, I would say that with AI, AI can probably manage the lower levels of you know, the foundation of the Bloom's taxonomy. AI can help in remembering facts, understanding facts, applying facts. Yes and no, you know, to test the student's understanding. However, when it comes to analyzing, evaluating and creating, I still believe in the value of discussions in the classroom, debating, sparring with your professors or with someone who can sit down with you, can break certain argumentative points with you. So that will probably be a bit more high touch certain parts of learning can be high tech. And when I'm also thinking about if we want to make education inclusive and accessible to all, for example, to in very far flung places where educators, you know, in the form of human beings can't really travel to the village, then probably AI can help in a little. But, um, you know, I still believe very much in the power of high tech, high touch styles of education. Wow, okay, so AI has a role uh, in adaptable learning and also in parts of the high tech, uh, high touch component of learning, if we could break it down like that. Yeah, so thanks so much. Uh, I've been just, I've just been informed that uh, it is rather unfortunate that uh, Peter might not be able to join us for the rest of the session, but uh, that's okay. We still have, uh, <laughs> we still have Michael and Yvonne to hold the fort uh, and myself. Uh, I'm just looking at this question from uh, Majori. Uh, so her question is uh, preparing for future threats such as pandemics and conflict should be an essential part of nation building. How do you think we can democratize future thinking, long term as well, make it accessible to the youth and to people from developing countries whose priorities lie with making ends meet because of poverty? So um, <laughs> if, I, if I may kind of you know uh, become a panelist for a short while with this question, uh, it turns out that uh, one of my projects at the Institute of Policy Studies is precisely looking at uh, democratizing long-term thinking. So uh, it is a, uh, as part of Institute of Policy Studies, as part of our work, 
uh, we do a bit of long-term thinking for Singapore society, and we have come up with a, a digital web-based application called Quest2030.sg, where we expose people to different trends, and we invite people, uh, members of the public, to uh, share about uh, what they feel about those trends and get a feel, get a feel of Singapore in 2030. So, uh, and I am also a big fan of uh, Dr. Peter Bishop and what he does with Teach the Future. So his online resources uh, there is really uh, a huge, uh, really, really, really uh, um, uh, such a huge effort in trying to aggregate futures resources. Uh, for students. So if there's any teacher out there who, you know, <laughs> was thinking about how to introduce uh, future thinking to their classrooms, please go to Teach the Future. Uh, so I'm being completely objective here. <laughs> I'm making a pitch uh, for both mine and uh, uh, Dr. Peter Bishop's uh, uh, Teach the Future as well. So I think you're right that in the sense there is a tension between all this so-called abstract trends and uh, some of the immediate priorities, but I just want to make the pitch that actually those two things are more intertwined than we think. Uh, climate change is no longer a 20 year away kind of thing. It is being felt today. And uh, I hope that the present emergencies today can actually help people to realize, take a step back and realize that there is actually something they can still do today. Uh, to help them prepare for uh, the alternative future. So it's not just the expected futures of what tomorrow might bring, but also just slowly thinking ahead, think about building up resources so that they can you know, create massive uh, changes that they need to make. So it's uh, what I want to get a sense is uh, provide you, provide all of us with a sense is that, you know how the, the, the water, the drops of water falling on a rock kind of thinking. So, a trickle by itself doesn't do much, but if we are able to plan ahead and do things consistently, uh, drop by drop, you know, you get a hole in the rock. So that's the, uh, I hope that's a sense of optimism. We can affect real change, but we also must be patient with ourselves that we can affect slow change slowly. And over time that could, could give us a, a big impact. So that's my uh, reflection of the question from Majori. And, I was just thinking if Yvonne or Michael, you have some thoughts about uh, that question as well, even if Peter is not able to answer. So uh, Yvonne, would you like to go first? <clears throat> it is indeed very real. I was just um, thinking about, pardon me, another framework. Uh, you know, that I mean, we, you know, we're so familiar with that self-actualization. To reach self-actualization, you actually need to look at basic needs. And there are really a lot of countries where even when the basic needs are not even met, you know, it's very, very hard to encourage their young people, their people to even think of self-actualization. I'm just thinking maybe, you know, one day when we can slowly bring in certain, certain, you know, certain members of that particular country to come and do this exchange program. I, I know it sounds really idealistic, but if we can start by making a difference to some of the starfish in that particular country and we build in them, we feed them, we teach them how to fish and if we can bring them back to the country you know hopefully we can effect some more positive changes yeah my humble yeah. thoughts yeah. <laughs> michael well i think you both covered it pretty well it's, it's, there's not too much from my side to act. i think singapore in comparison to the region in education in particular also stands out so education has always been a critical part of nation building just by choosing English language as her, as her language of instruction that, that made such a huge difference. And you can see it in other countries where there's no common language, but many, many native languages in the country, right? So it's, I think this question needs to be answered in a very a cultural and probably country specific uh, context. Uh, uh, and, and um, what is what is important that whatever policies each country will adopt, it, it should ensure the highest degree of equity and accessibility. And Singapore is doing well in this context. I think it's Peter, Peter back. Let's let's yes, get hello Peter, yes. you're back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, Peter, we were just talking about uh, teach the future and democratizing futures versus uh, survival needs. So if you could comment okay, on that. Okay, well, 
<laughs> I, my, right my brother-in-law, who, my brother-in-law, who is quite a technical person, is still asleep, <laughs> so I can't. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I'm now on the cell phone, so <laughs> I apologize. I went. I mean, I was getting to such a conclusion, and then all of a sudden, guess, Michael, this is what hybrid education is like. You know that. <laughs> This future, electric. No, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize. So, uh, what, whatever I can do to, to make up for the sorriness, uh, let me know or just continue on as, as you're doing, please. No, Peter, we were getting to the question of democratizing futures uh, yes. versus the very urgent need of survival needs here in the present. So, uh, we a uh, question for you to think about. Well, I'll, I'll, I don't think about it. I'll just answer it. I mean, a college professor, I don't have to think. <laughs> I, just have, I just have answers. Well, it, 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 and a democratizing futures is just one thing. We call it futures for all. Um, and there is a, um, as I said, I worked for most of my life preparing professional futurists, which are need, needed. Uh, I hope there's some on the call. And, but just like we need professional accountants, and we need professional engineers, but in order to, to, you know, you don't need a plumber to unblock the toilet. You don't need an accountant to balance your checkbook or understand what your credit card interest payments are. Those are literacies. And what we're pushing is futures literacy. Unfortunately, in schools today, I love the question, what would you study, Michael? Thank you. I would study futures, but I couldn't because no schools are teaching it. <laughs> So, so there is that, uh, you know, that, that issue there. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we do need to put futures in schools all throughout. I mean, we're teach the past. My question to the panelists, which I never got to, why are we not introducing students to the future? We know how to do that now. We're good at it. Why aren't we putting that in schools? I have reasons of that my own, but I'd love to hear the panelists' view of why we're not teaching futures in school. Yeah, how about that, uh, Yvonne, Michael? Yvonne, you go first. You work for an institution, so my I, I don't need to take I need to take I don't need to take care of my employer. So um, you have to find a very diplomatic answer to that. Well, you you have hmm, you know I was looking at the other question that um another yeah attendee has asked. I really want to answer that question more than Peter's very hard question. So I'm like, hmm, how do I answer it now? Wow, okay, this are really, the caveat and the disclaimer here is that my opinion is mine, yeah? It doesn't represent any organization. <laughs> mm. Yvonne, let me, ask you, let me ask you, why are we not talking about futures in career education? <laughs> I mean, if there's any occupation, career counseling should be about the future and it is about the future. Absolutely. But I don't see them using foresight. I don't see them using modern uh, futuristic techniques in there. That's your field. What, what's the holdup? What, what's happening? With all due respect, with all due respect to organizations yeah. and um, the yardsticks and measure that people are using, futures thinking to a lot of people, you cannot measure you cannot measure what the results might be. It's a bit too abstract, you know, to a lot of yes. people. It, especially, for example, in career counseling and career development, when is the person unemployed? And when will that person get a job again? It's exactly yep. what people are looking at. And uniquely to certain countries, not naming them, okay. to certain countries, the starting salaries of a lot of graduates, it's very important. When they graduate and they start at, for example, $1,000 or they start at $2,000 means a lot to the nation and to the university. So a lot of people would want to focus on that rather than focusing on why are we not teaching them foresight, which I fully respect and agree with you. Foresight's future thinking is such a powerful tool that I think it's, it should be basic. It should be something that should be taught at, at junior yes. college at you know at 17 18 year, year olds you know they should learn about that before they graduate well let me ask let me ask you another and this is unfair for me to put you on the spot here but you can check this out with your colleagues at your university well what's the justification for teaching history do we do we measure the results of 
of learning about history every single year in K-12 education and some in higher education. I think we should understand history too, but is there a measurement for that? And why should we require foresight to have a measurement that's a bottom line, this is the ROI of teaching foresight when we have no ROI for teaching history? Yeah. That, you know, I, I asked yeah. ask my history teacher before, why are we studying history? And she said, <laughs> when, you, when you study history, then you can understand, when you, when you study the past, you can understand the future. Yeah. Sounds yes. familiar? Sounds well, familiar. that's what they say, but I, 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 I go back to a book that was published in the middle of the financial crisis, 2008, by a bunch of, of two economists in the United States. And the title of this book is, This Time Will Be Different. It was a history of bubbles, beginning yeah. with the tulip bubble in the 18th century and the Southeast uh, Islands bubble and everything else, the Pacific, and all the bubbles, this time will be different. And it wasn't, it was exactly <laughs> the same. So we're studying all this past, repeating the mistakes over and over again. Uh, I, I would say that if, you, if we wanna put measures on it, okay, let's be fair, let's <laughs> put the measure on the past as well as on the future. And I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to that conference if they want to work on that. <laughs> well, Peter, right. Peter yeah. let, let, let me give you my perspective on it. I mean, I worked for, for NUS here for a good number of years. Um, so number one, I don't think foresight is a fully recognized subject. And no, I'm not saying not. I agree with it. No, it's not. It's not. So um, I, I, you know, that needs to be promoted and I'm not saying how and where and when, but um, I've, when you work with uh, development banks like World Bank, ADB, they have large departments or at least within each department for different industry workloads, we have four sites, right? Four side teams because when they invest, they invest for five to 10 years. Their horizon yep. is very, 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 very long, right? For such long programs. So the, the topic of foresight, I, I don't see that very prominent uh, as, as in terms You're of right. awareness. And secondly, you need people to teach. Yep. And it would be usually taught, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, preferably taught within a vertical, within maybe it could be could be toured together with history but also together with computer science etc cetera, etc cetera. so that is a very different type of skill set which the, the educators and lecturers need to learn um and yep, it is that is a tall order but we need to manage that i think it's very, but it's a chicken important. and the egg problem we're not going to graduate <coughs> professor foresight unless there are jobs for them to teach within so it's, it's, it's catch 22, we can't get a job because there are no positions and we have no positions because we don't have a supply of people who can teach in those positions. So that's, what I, that's why I go back to a disruption, uh, some kind of big bang, the, big, the pandemic was a big bang for remote education. You, you mentioned that uh, we're doing it right now, despite all the difficulties we're having. This is the way that we now communicate across the world. It required education to get out of its silo and say, face-to-face -face is fine, it's you know, better in many ways, but it's not the only way, et cetera, et cetera. What is the big bang that is going to require us to be educating every student on how to deal with change and how to prepare for the future? What is that, this, that, that event that will wake everybody up and shake them out of that particular, oh, we don't have to teach the future, we can pretty well take care of it. I don't know what that is. That's my question to, to the panel. All right. Um, you know, at the same time, Peter, uh, we've got a lot of other questions as well. So oh, please do. I don't yeah. want to monopolize. Thank you for letting me back in. <laughs> but you, you also ask a really good question. I think the pandemic has really shook people up. And in terms of uh, thinking about the unexpected, and I think that has entered uh, into the consciousness of many people. Uh, I mean, the geopolitical shocks, the news as well. But I just wanted to stay on, on topic here as well when it comes to education uh, and attending to some of these questions. So we have one about um, how can, so this is a, a question that I think you would like as well in terms of how might we get there. So this is one of the, how might we get to one of your uh, desired future, which is uh, how can education evolve to ensure understanding and encourage thirst for knowledge? So I think this goes back to the point of curiosity that I think Yvonne brought up. Uh, rather than just hand, knowing how to 
uh, rather than how to handle the flood of information and competition for grades. So yeah, how do we how how might we begin to think about how we get to that desired uh, education? So uh, yeah, Peter, you go first, and then Mike go in. Uh, Yvonne. Well, the education does change, despite my pessimism about the expected future and the con, you know the conserving institution that it is, which still is. Um, it does change. It did add computer science in the 70s and 80s. It did add biotechnology in the 90s. And, and now we're teaching AI and things like that. The, the common denominator for change is what I'll call a demand signal. When a demand signal appears on edu to education, when it finally recognizes that the world wants these things and frankly will be willing to pay for it, at the end of the day, it's still a business. They need to make money too. And then they will say, oh, we'll have departments of foresight. Frankly, I agree with Michael. Until that ha happens, until the public, until parents and students say, why are we not learning about the future? There won't be much change. So to me, it's the demand signal and the lack of it right now. Yeah, uh, Michael? Well, I, I saw kind of two different questions in, in, in one statement. In one words, how do we instill the first for knowledge in, for, in the student, right? So that's more psychological question and uh, it's more comfortably we are in society and Singapore is a good, good as, as, as Yvonne rightly said, uh, Singapore sits comfortably, particularly in, in comparison to neighboring countries, the, the need for, you know, being adaptive uh, for resilience is just not as hard as the neighboring countries. And then you work with students from Indonesia, Cambodia, Vietnam, you see a dramatic change where if, if a young person knows that um, he or she is responsible for bringing a family out of poverty or at least to a different income level, that first can hardly be matched by somebody who, who grows up in a, in a pretty well-off family, right? So it, 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 this is a really hard question. And uh, um, I think a, a lot falls back also to, to parents and, 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 and upbringing. But what, what, um, uh, what, what, what Peter men mentioned, uh, I think Peter, our job is to be optimistic. We cannot be pessimistic, okay? That's literally by definition. I'm both, I'm both, I'm both. <laughs> and probably no, that's, that's, uh, that's good and that's great. I think the, the general uh, interna internationalization um, that more and more institutions work together will, and which has happened for, for over many, many, many years. And also let, let's, since I assume many, many listeners here are also from, from Singapore, Singapore in the early days always looked to UK, US, Canada, because we are peers or maybe, maybe one step back, one step up in terms of education quality. Now for at least five to 10 years, strong focus to support, but also learn within the ASEAN community. And that you see also in, uh, that, that's critically important to um, support neighboring countries, students and educational system to progress. Uh, uh, so when we have a bit of a regional uh, look at it, I think in that context, Singapore has made a, a lot of gains, but I worked in the US in the international office for many years. And I was hired for one particular reason. Michael Praise brings students to countries which are not popular with students. And it was a hard task. I went to Mongolia, India, South America, Kazakhstan, et cetera. You, you find some students, but it's a hard task. And this is what, what educators, whoever works in university, <coughs> What we need to do, we, and including with employers together, we need to ensure that learning through just the experience in terms of you, you put students in certain situations or in certain countries, that is a tremendous experience which, which shapes students' learning path and eventually also the career. Yeah, Yvonne? Hey, Ping, thank you for your question. I love your question. I would say it's very important for students to be exposed to the ability and the agency that they have within themselves to make a difference to people. So I've always wondered, you know, in Singapore, so we have the primary school system, the secondary school system, the junior college or polytechnic system, then you go to university. And a lot of times I see a lot of volunteering work that is done at secondary school, junior college or polytechnic level. I've always wondered why don't we do more at the primary school level? 
For example, why can't we bring our younger children into, for example, one-room flats in Singapore where, you know, really very, very impoverished older folks actually stay? Why can't we expose them to the, to the society issues that are already present in Singapore and ask them, what do you think we can do for them? Is it food? Is it, for example, companionship? How can we identify the issues that they have? Is it social isolation? Is it just hunger? Is it just physical hunger? Why is it that we are not helping them to see the issues? I mean, honestly, as a mom, I understand why some of my friends wouldn't want to expose their children to this because it is painful. It really opens up a can of worms because when you expose sometimes, sometimes when you expose younger children to a lot of issues, some children can internalize it and get very, very worried and pessimistic about it. But some will be like, oh, okay, but it's not happening to me. And some will be like, no, let's do something about it. I just believe that if we can expose children at a younger age to see that there are actually issues in the world and there are ways that we can do, there are, there are things that they can do with their hands to make a difference. I think that starts. And it starts, you know, I really agree with what Michael said. It's not just the school. It's also the upbringing. It's the parents. We must all see that we are all members of this world. We are all members of the society that we can make a difference and we can do something about something. It's not about I'm going to gain and you're going to lose. We must have the abundance mentality. I really believe that the more we have, the more we can bless and we can give. So it's not just the school. It's not just, you know, the education system it must be everybody doing something. And I'm very heartened to share with you that when the pandemic hit, I think in Singapore, we saw a lot of very, very good examples of how some parents got their children to, to actually come to, together to come up with care packages to give it to the neighbours in the block of flats. You know, in Singapore, we live in like apartments. They're like 16, 20 storeys. There are a few units. And these parents actually make their children, they come together, they do very, very small little care packages. They live at the doors of their neighbours and say, it's just something to bless you. I think that's a very good way to just start the children to say that, you know, I, I may be young, but I can do something. I can do something. If we can train our young people, our young children to spot, to see a need and to feel that need, I think we really can change the world in our very little ways. And, and, and De I, I can't agree with you more. Notice that's a skill. The, sc the schools need to put those skills on their learning objectives as opposed to the content. The content is fine. You need some content, but we don't have time to, to spend all that time on content. The skill of addressing problems, working with others, collaborating, problem solving, critical thinking, the whole list of skills should be the primary learning objectives for schools in the 21st century, not the, not the, the knowledge that we're now you know, basically still requiring out of textbooks. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much, uh, Peter and Yvonne. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, our time together is coming very, uh, very rapidly to a close. Uh, thanks so much. But before we go, uh, may I ask each of the three panelists to just uh, give, us, give us something, give us a, a closing statement, a sentence, a thought uh, for our audience to live with? Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe Michael, would you like to go? That's a lot of wisdom to be put into one sentence. Well, um, I think I would simply say uh, never stop learning. And uh, for, for me, my best way of learning is um, just listen. I often meet people and ask, can you just catch up for coffee? I want to know what you do. And tell me what are your thoughts about your own work and what are your strategies, etc. Right? So it doesn't have to be re directly related to your own job scope, but uh, um, every every single small discussion with, with another colleague or somebody else in, in, in the industry, it's a learning opportunity. Don't lose it. Yvonne? I would say, let's bring back the beauty of altruism. Let's bring back the beauty of altruism. Let's do things for people just because we want people to benefit, just because we want people to be well. And with that in mind, then we use all our education, our skills, and everything that we have to make the world a better place. Yeah, very inspirational. Thank you, Yvonne. And Peter? Yes, my uh, uh, one of the assumptions about education is that to be successful, one has to have the right answer to the questions that the teacher asks 
and the right solution to the problems that they present. Unfortunately, the educator in a desire to, be, uh, to make education accessible answers questions that have one right answer. They, uh, they present problems like math problems that have one right solution. How many real questions in our world as adults do we run into that have one right answer and what problems have one right solution? No, it's better or worse answers. It's not complete relativism. You can, can't think, but what's the best approach here versus, versus the right approach? And if we had a population, a citizenry that was prepared to deal with positive and negative with benefits and, and costs, we would be a much better society other. And I think the right answer mentality, the right solution mentality, we argue about that stuff all the time. There is no one right answer. There is no one right future. I wish we were teaching. And notice that in skills, there are multiple answers and multiple ways of achieving the same goal. That would be my hope for education. Wow, thanks, Peter. Thanks for also the monumental task of uh, summing up some of your thoughts in such a pithy way. Uh, I am so delighted to have had this discussion. I am so glad to have spent the afternoon this way. And I hope many of you out there listening in feel the same way as well. And so with that, uh, please join me in thanking, in thanking the speakers and, uh, and the team as well. And I hand this over to Ani. Ani, go ahead. Thank you very much, Eddie, and uh, really all, all panelists. I really enjoyed uh, the conversation so much that, you know, uh, if you can see my papers, it's like, whoops, can't really see. Um, yeah, just to share quickly, if I, if you allow me to indulge, you know, a quick uh, minute to kind of share some of my key takeaways. I think, you know, this future of education is really a hot button topic. I think we can spend the whole season of the Future Forward, future forward webinar only talking on education and not other topics, because I think there are many, uh, you know, elements into education. I think uh, one, uh, one of the key takeaway that I really uh, took note is really when we talk about AI, and uh, I really like the, the comments from Yvonne around the high uh, tech and high touch, just because I think one of the missing uh, thing that, uh, that, was, that didn't really appear in our, in today's conversation is really about the role of teachers, right? And the university lecturers, because just because when you talk about AI, I was quite concerned that should I actually start to look for another job just in case, you know, uh, the schools and teachers and lecturers are no longer you know needed you know in, in teaching uh, uh, the students and i think uh, just to kind of help Yvonne in answering the question on why is future thinking not part of the classroom at the moment um this is precisely what we are doing peter uh, here at the Lee Kuan Yew school of public policy executive education singapore futures we are working with schools and education institutions to to offer uh, future thinking um, sort of um, activities and programs to students. In we have started to work with a few of the junior colleges in Singapore, and we hope to kind of uh, we are also doing our own uh, uh, futures uh, thinking competition for our local as well as regional youth participants. So we hope to kind of then multiply and amplify this initiative even further. And last but not least, uh, maybe uh, let, let, I would like to invite participants to submit your feedback if you know to, to help us to um, um, improve future episodes on uh, of this uh, features forward uh, webinar. Um, uh, next slides, please. Just bear with me for a couple of minutes to just um, run through a few admin slides. Um, so today we have discussed the future of education. In the next episode, we are, we are turning slightly into another topic on the futures of food. So there we'll be discussing around the food security, food sustainability, you know, um, um, not just in the local context as well as in the regional and international context. So that will happen on the 31st of August, um, same time. Um, next slides, please. Yes, and touching upon the, the point by, I think it was Michael who mentioned about lifelong learning. Here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, we are also offering, you know, um, executive education programs. One is on future. So parents, if you feel like you need to equip yourself with future thinking um, uh, uh, um, skills and if it's literacy, literacy before you can actually teach your children, feel free to attend our Futures for Public Policy, um, the um, second run uh, um, scheduled for uh, 
15 from 13 to 16 of September. And uh, there's a uh, early bird discount of 20%. So uh, do scan the QR code on the screen. So if you are interested, and of course, we do have a couple of other skill based uh, uh, um, executive programs for you to, you know, um, upskill and also pick up new skills. And next slide, please. And yes, keep in touch, especially I will really look forward to working closer with the teach for the future speeder. So let's, you know, let's, you know, um, continue to discuss on how we can democratize the future thinking and strategic foresight not just to our traditional stakeholders in terms of the policymakers as well as you know adult and professional learners but also slightly uh to, to slightly younger audience to the youth as well as the students with that i uh, really i uh, thank so much you know all panelists and eddie uh, uh, uh michael yvonne and uh, peter for the uh, uh very thought-provoking and very insightful conversation and thanks so much, you know, our audience who has tuned in with us for the last one hour and 15 minutes. And I really wish you, uh, uh, um, you know, the um, uh, great evening, a great evening ahead. And um, until we see you again in August, take care and have a, have a good day ahead. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.